Hello, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hancock, and this is the International Humanistic Management Association's uh, Professionals Lunch and Learn. And um, I am one of the board members of the USA chapter, and I run a company called Humanist Learning Systems, and I am the uh, education partner for this. And we offer HRCI, SHRM, and general certificates um, at the end of the workshop. Uh, my co-host is Elizabeth Castillo. Elizabeth? Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Elizabeth. I'm out in Arizona State University. We really appreciate you being here. Excellent. And today we are going to talk about the economy for the common good. Our guest is Bridget Knapper. She's a founding director of Economy for the Common Good UK and a member of the management team of the International Federation for the Economy of the Common, uh, common Good. The, 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 the. Uh, she has a background in strategy and communications and is a consultant with Terra, the sustainability and systems change consultancy. Bridget, welcome and thanks for joining us. Thanks very much. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here and uh, there, are, there are strong links between the uh, International Humanistic Management Network and the economy for the common good. So it feels like we're sister organizations. Absolutely. Um, you know, concurrent agendas. Um, that's not what I was, you know, but similar agendas. So um, what we'd like you to do, Bridget, is just kind of give us 10, 15 minutes on what the economy for the common good is. And if you had to give people, you know, some best practices that they could take away and use right now, whether they're a professor or an HR professional or a working professional or someone who's doing consultancy, what are things people can do to help make an economy for the common good? Sure, I will do my best. Um, do, am I allowed to share my screen? Yes, you should be able to. And if you're not, I'll um, make it so you can. Lovely, thank you. Okay. Excellent. Lovely. So, yes, um, economy for the common good, serving people and planet. Um, and we abbreviate to, abbreviated to ECG. So ECG is an international movement with local initiatives. It's mainly a volunteer um, grassroots movement. So it's set up by groups of people coming together, inspired by the idea, who set up um, what are called local chapters around the world. And it was started 11 years ago by Christian Felber and a group of entrepreneurs um just after the financial crash um with a belief that there can be a different way a different way of doing economy a different way of doing business and it's it started off in austria germany switzerland um and the german speaking part of italy has now spread to um various countries in europe um very active in latin america um, quite a few um, that I'm afraid that map is a bit out of date, but there's quite a lot of um, new chapters in Africa now. And there's an association that's been set up in um, the US, in um, Colorado. Um, so that's, that's who we are. And um, it has a model for companies, for uh, municipalities, uh, universities, and that's our kind of list of numbers from around the world. So Christian Felber set out his kind of vision for um, what he un understands as an economy for the common good in this book, Change Everything. Um, and that's available um, with Z Books. What I've done, I've done a list of um, kind of links and resources um, on a page which I can kind of post the document at the end in the chat for for everybody um, and so christian says our, our current economic system has been turned on its head money has become an end in itself rather than a means for what really counts a good life for all and the whole model really is about um repurposing the economy and re-embedding it so this is um a current picture of, of uh, 
you know, maybe the most common picture of what people think of as the economy or how the economy is treated in society today as being the kind of the dominant thing, the thing that um, is above everything else. I'm sorry about my cat yowling in the background. <laughs> um, and the environment and people uh, seem to be subservient to the economy. Whereas um, what ECG is about is re-embedding the economy to its, its proper home, that it is embedded within society, within uh, the natural world. And the economy is at the service of people and planet. And so the vision of ECG, the well-being of people and the environment becomes the highest goal of economic activity. And we can see this through the, um, the various the concepts, various concepts of business and the role of the economy. And these are really importantly what model we have in our minds as to what actions we bring into the world. So the first model is value for shareholders, where um, again, business is above everything else. The main purpose of companies is to make profit and maximize financial returns. And external costs they cause while doing it are not internalized. So things like um, the health costs for illnesses related to air pollution caused by um, polluting companies or um, people um, is not accounted for, um, but profit is internalized. In the second model, um, value is shared. There's some notion of um, relation um, a relational model with other, other stakeholders. Um, and there's a focus on doing less harm and um, offsetting harm with good actions. Um, and this is, this is more, there was a question about um, stakeholder capitalism. This is, this is possibly where we are in this model. Um, some of the external costs are internalized, but, but not all, and it's not, it's not deep enough to, to balance that out. Uh, and then the final model, this is the model that we're aiming for, the, um, you know, with the, the true home of business at service of, of people and the environment. And this is much more of a regenerative model. So through the whole of the core activities of a company, it's, it's being conscious about how it does business the whole value chain. Um, so much more a regenerative, it's, it's doing good and it's business acting as nature. The, um, the kind of scientific picture we have for that is um, those people who might be familiar with the donut economics model. So this gives us the, um, here we see the outer circle is the ecological ceiling these are the planetary boundaries that, that you know, we can't go beyond. We've only got one Earth um, and we're in, in deep trouble and so are future generations if we go beyond them. And this is based on scientific data from the um, Stockholm Resilience Centre, climate scientists. And the inner circle represents um, human, human needs, the social foundation. So basic needs, and not just basic needs, but health, education, equality, social equity, political voice. So for us to live in a safe and just space, we need to be in the green zone. We need to be in the, the, the meat of the donut. And Kate Rayworth talks about, um, are organizations degenerative by design or are they regenerative by design? What makes for human thriving in this place, in this, in this town, in this city, in this company? Um, and how can we, um, you know, how can we act like nature? What is, what is the most regenerative thing that we can do? So we've got um, the sort of scientific um, basis, but also on the human level, what, what ECG is trying to do is pegging the economy back to its original purpose, as stated in constitutions, if you're a country lucky enough to have one. Um, so we see that uh, 
in uh, various constitutions, there's a notion of the economy serving the common good or serving the public good, including the United States. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, promote the general welfare. And the ECG model is very much founded on um, democratic principles. Uh, and Christian talks about um, sovereign democracy and sovereign, the word meaning above all, and it's people who are above all, rather than in the earlier models that we saw where it was the economy that was above all, the kind of maximizing profit was above all, was above the people. So what's different in, um, in an economy for the common good? So we can compare compare the current system with the, the model, the ECG model. In the current system, the goal seems to be money, the acquisition of money, the maximization of profit. Whereas in the ECG, it's, um, the goal is the common good. Strategy in the current system is competition. In ECG, it's democratic collaboration. Success indicators in the current system is profit and the financial balance sheet, and in ECG it's the common good balance sheet. Indicators in the current system are GDP, gross domestic products, and in ECG it's the common good um, product, common good index. And I'll say a little bit more about that later. So at the heart of the model is the common good balance sheet, the common good matrix, which is um, underpinned by these four values, human dignity, solidarity and social justice, environmental sustainability, transparency and democracy. And these values, here we have the common good matrix, common good balance sheet. These values are investigated across the, the key stakeholder groups of an organization. So we have suppliers, owners, and financial service providers, employees, customers, and other companies, and the social environment, including future generations. And the idea of the balance sheet is to um, raise consciousness. And it's asking questions of how are these values lived in the company with regard to these stakeholders? And, and they're there um, for each of these um, 20 themes, there are uh, questions that, that, um, that make the organization think about, about this situation. So with the suppliers, um, how, is, uh, how are the workers, workers treated in the supply chain? How are, they, uh, how are the products produced um, by, in, in supp by suppliers under which conditions? looking at ownership, um, how does the ownership model affect the um, values of the, the mission and purpose of the organization? Where does the finances come from? Is there, is there a risk that the, um, the, 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 the financer can um, skew the, the mission and purpose of, a, of an organization? What are conditions like for employees? What's the um, what's the pay gap between the lowest and the highest paid? What's the pay? What's the um, diversity like? What's the rep representation like within the within the company? For every of the, of the stakeholder groups, it's the um, the these values are investigated and looking at um, one of the sort of uh, best practice companies, Ello Bao is um, a worldwide supplier of non-contact sensor technology. And I, I chose this company because often um, there are companies that are, are very close to kind of um, agriculture or food and there's a, there's, a, there's a relationship so you can see why they've, they've taken on ECG and why it makes sense for them. So I chose this company because it's, it's maybe an unlikely one to, you know, to have that um, um, mission and purpose. Um, but for Ello Bio, they um, produce these um, non-contact sensor technology supplies and supply worldwide. Uh, and they're very, um, 
they see themselves as a, a, a bridge builder between ECG and an industry in which the ideas of environmental sustainability um, are finding it, it, it ha hard to find a way in. All of the company's products are manufactured in a climate neutral manner. Um, and Elabau does this by, um, it relies on self-generated renewable energies, which means it produces more electricity than it consumes, and thereby reducing the major majority of avoidable greenhouse gas emissions. All emissions along the value chain are accounted for, and it also takes into account emissions caused by its purchase parts, transportation, and for example, um, employee mobility. Um, it's also got an interesting ownership structure in order to safeguard um, the values and keep the values within the company. It actually set up a foundation. So this foundation um, owns 90% um, of the company. And the, um, it also has various initiatives that it does for um, educating younger people and it has um, an employment service for immigrants and refugees. Um, so across all of its core business activities, it's, um, it's, it's seeking to um, not, not just minimize harm, but act actively um, produce um, beneficial results for, for the community and for the environment. Um, there was um, a survey conducted of um, the companies that have done a common good balance sheet by the University of Valencia, and it shows that um, companies who completed one, staff motivation and well-being have improved, corporate reputation has been enhanced, carbon footprint has been reduced, there's greater sustainability in their supply chain, and a much local, much more local supply chain. There are higher levels of customer trust and loyalty. And the, the idea is that um, companies that have a common good balance sheet would get reduced taxes or tax breaks, lower tariffs, lower interest rates for bank loans, priority in public procurement, preferential treatment in research corporations, and support from economic development agencies. But the result being that sustainable products and services would become cheaper than non-sustainable ones. And one of our companies, Vaude, an outdoor clothes manufacturer, um, we took to the United Nations. They're invited by the United Nations to present as a company that was achieving the sustainable development goals. Um, and we've also got um, we've also got a guide about how how the relationship between the, the common good balance sheet and the sustainable development goals. And that's one of the links in the resources I've got for you. Um, so Vaude was at the United Nations and they were begging for uh, legislation in order for them there to be a, a proper level playing field. So for companies like them who are using things like massively innovative doing um using plant-based oil to make the little plastic toggles on the on the rucksacks using um milk protein for the linings of the um walking boots um but the but they're at a disadvantage from companies who were extracting polluting um with with the types of materials that they're using The, so that's on the kind of company side. The model also applies to um, local towns, municipalities, cities, and regions. Um, these are some of the things that a, um, a local council or city could do. One is to have a democratic assembly. So that's like a citizens assembly where people come together to, um, to, 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 um, to produce a sort of common good index. And the common good index is, is where the people, the local people, and this is one of the questions um, of the participants who decides what the common good is. 
Um, so people decide what the common good is and the common good index is, um, uh, so people would decide on what, what are the 20 headline themes that make for a good life in my area. And so that, that's discussed in a democratic assembly and policy is measured against this. Um, the the um, city itself can do a common good balance sheet um, and the city of Valencia has completed one, two districts of Barcelona have completed one, city of Stuttgart, um, or for, their, for the kind of publicly owned um, departments. Um, so the administration itself can uh, complete a common good balance sheet. It can also promote um, to companies and organizations in its region um, to, to do a common good balance sheet. Um, and um, it's a bit like here in, in London and in the UK, there are some local councils where they've said to companies, if you um, become members of the National Living Wage Foundation, they get um, uh, business rate relief. So you know, they could get business rate relief if they were um, producing a common good balance sheet. And, and also in measures like um, having preferential treatment in public procurement. Once a number of um, areas have, have um, entered the process and, and done a common good balance sheet or adopted ECG policies, they can form together to create a common good region. And I think one of the questions was about how can we, how can we scale it up and, um, uh, through, through international cooperation? Well, this is a, a regional cooperation. And um, yeah, the goal being having um, common good countries a bit like um, there's a, with the Wellbeing Government Alliance um, that you might know through the We All Alliance is one such initiative. And here's uh, some examples of um, companies which have, which have gone through the balance sheet process. There are some banks in there, um, as well as universities, newspaper, charities, Greenpeace. Thank you. Can Thank I you so much. Yeah. That was really interesting and um, I think really helpful. And I took a lot of notes because I'm like, ooh, I can do this locally. <laughs> I can talk to local politicians right. about this. <laughs> um, and local business consortiums that have, have sprouted up mm -hmm. in the last couple of years. Um, I think th the big question I have has to do um, you address the question of who decides what the common good is. Um, but a lot of what you said, I can hear people in my community, because I do live in a really conservative area, say, you know, well, you're talking about socialism, you're talking about communism. As soon as you start talking about the common good, you are talking about communism. Um, so, which is not true at all, obviously. Um, but how would you respond to that? Well, I, th I think I remember when I first got involved in um, ECG, somebody described it like this. They said, when, when you only know apples and you only know oranges, a mango comes along and you go, oh, well, it's a bit orange, so it must be an orange. Oh, well, it's a bit green, so it must be an apple. I mean, that's a kind of very um, basic kind of story, but um, you know, we're, we're so used to that kind of polarization, aren't we? that it's kind of, you know, there's, there's, there's two ends of the scales and that's it. You know, it's either one thing or the other. Um, but there's a whole kind of range of um, initiatives um, in the middle. And, and I, think, I think Christian has the sort of common good coming off at a sort of you know, perpendicular kind of um, axis, uh, you know, somewhere else on the line. Cool. So the other question that I had had to do with you had a slide that talked about the current system and then mm -hmm. uh, the ECG system. And I was thinking, you know, is this an either or situation or can we synthesize the current and the ideal um, into some sort of 
meshed thing. And mm -hmm. is it possible or is it, we just have to move <laughs> to, to a new state? No, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, it's interesting that Christian's book is called Change Everything because it's not really proposing to change everything. <laughs> you know, we are, you know, it is, it is um, still using markets, but it's about the kind of sensible design of markets. And um, you know, it's it's um, it, yeah, the, a, lot, a lot of the a lot of the things we that we had around the design of markets we, we're not we're not using anymore, um, and so it's that whole thing of you know the current system you know was designed by people and it can be redesigned by people to make it work better for people. So it's. Um, it's not about a planned economy. It's not about communism. It's about um, it's about experiencing the things that we experienced, you know, in in COVID. You know that kind of when people experience the solidarity of support. Um, you know what it means to be able to re rely on your neighbours. You know, rely on um, health workers. You know that realizing that they're actually a bit more important than. Um, you know, people doing other things that don't seem to be that much related to the real economy. Okay, um, so getting rich won't be necessarily taboo under the economy for common good. It's just getting rich in service of the common good. Um, I mean, the um, uh, you know, make, making a profit is not a bad thing. It's how, it's what the yeah the pur purpose of profit is it's for it's for a goal isn't it it's kind of what is, what is the profit serving sure i kind of when i think of companies as being either good companies or bad companies part of what i'm thinking about is is the service or good that they're providing helping society or is it making society worse off Mm -hmm. um, it's not just, and, and that goes into how do they pr produce it, obviously. And I, I really yeah. liked the matrix and the framework because I could see immediately how it's useful at all levels of society, right? Um, mm -hmm. And you, it kind yeah. of frames that we all, I think most people have a concept of this is a good company and this is not a good company. And it, there's not one thing that makes it good or bad. It's kind of the holistic picture of it, yeah. so. Yeah. I mean, the, the thing that really bugs me is um, in the morning listening to the news and they uh, then there's the kind of the business slot and the business slot says, well, so and so uh, this month has reported this level of profit and that's it. It's, it's like, right. And, you know, how how do they treat the workers? How is it? <laughs> how are the things made? Where are they made? Under what conditions? You know, it's it's uh it's just a kind of but that seems to be the news the news is the kind of the amount of money that they've they've um, posted so. yeah i think think yesterday netflix said that their growth rate wasn't as big as it had been last year when everybody suddenly needed netflix they didn't lose customers they just didn't grow at the astron astronomical rate they had been. And I thought to myself, well, and, and then the market, their share price plunged. And I thought to myself, why? I mean, they should be fundamentally a strong company, even if their growth rate is not astronomical, right? Your mm -hmm. company is either sustainable in making money and employing people and providing a service, or it's not sustainably doing that. And it, it just seemed to me that the, the focus on the growth part of it was missing the point entirely, but maybe mm. that's just me as a humanist. Mm. Well, who was it that said that, um, what, is the, what is the thing that grows within a finite structure? Um, and it's cancer. And it's kind of in nature, there's nothing, nothing grows exponentially. So that's a... Good point, good point. Elizabeth, do we have questions? Um, yeah, so um, Brandy's put something in the comments, but I really, I want, first I want to get to one she had submitted when she registered, um, and it is, what is your take on decentralized methods of conducting business that allow for less of a strangle on entrepreneurs and workers? And I, I think your slide had mentioned co-determination as one example. Mm, absolutely. Um, 
and yeah, and that that's about kind of um, employees. Um, you know, have you know what is their what's their power of decision making within an organisation, um, and uh, you know what what type of information is available to them. How can they get involved in um, in the things that happen within the company? For example, in recruitment, um, are are other employees involved in in the recruitment? Are they involved in the recruitment of their own managers? Um, and uh, I suppose with the ideal being kind of self-organizing teams and a flat structure, so kind of moving away from hierarchy. Do you have any examples of companies that have put that into practice? Like in the examples that you had shown, do you know of any companies that have gone to those kind of um, flatter structures or, or letting their employees be part of the management recruitment process? Um, there are some, I can't name them off the top of my head, um, but um, one of the links is to um, a page of case studies of companies according to each part of the matrix. Um, so you can uh, click on that, that theme and it, it will show you, I think it's, um, I think it's coming back to me, I think it's a garden, a garden company where they've done that and, um, and, and yeah. It just kind of com completely sort of flat structure. Now, Ella, Ella Bow, the um, sensor technology uh, company that I mentioned earlier, they're, they're pretty good on that as well, I think, yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Brandy, I'm gonna ask you to unmute and let you um, follow up. And then if, uh, if you wanna talk about the comment you typed. Thank you. Um, so, I guess my initial question was not, um, I guess I, I wasn't clear that it was to be specific to um, what Bridget is speaking on from um, what they've formulated uh, versus looking at where or if she's been aware of um, any possibilities of this happening. Um, because the, the fiat system to me also creates uh, some limitation when I compare it back to a conscious business model or sustainability practices as we weave together the, the ecosystems um, for community. And so that there are other ways of conducting exchanges within business models, whether uh, an individual practitioner or independently contracted person uh, to a nonprofit or a corporate business, um, that there could be um, this introduction on other means of what can become sustainable uh, for those conducting business from more of a conscious perspective um, that can lend to um, like cultural diversity and social um, uh, pieces of this. And so I was looking for um, maybe of any other places around the world or whatnot where they're not just looking to the fiat system um, to make things more sustainable and more equitable. Um, and also just within that service model. Um, so that's kind of what I was lending to. And I think that kind of ties into, my comment was in response to Jennifer's first question um, coming from the rural area. And again, just taking more of a holistic approach and looking at it, things being more regenerative, um, but I guess it's part of like the whole deconstructing what we've come from versus what we're looking at implementing. Um, so I'm not sure that that's a direct question <laughs> at this point. Thank you. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Well, I think you're talking in the importance of bringing in a critical perspective and really reimagining the system as a whole, right? And not necessarily starting out with our existing building blocks. Um, Bridget, you had talked about like social justice being one of the value lenses um, that the companies are using. Can you give a little more detail about what that looks like for a company and what some people are doing maybe to bring that kind of critical perspective to their operations? Mm -hmm. Um, yes, can I? Um, let me think, try and think of some examples. I might call an anchor to help me out if anchors uh, <laughs> can think of some off the top of her head. Um, so, I mean, the um, kind of th things like in, su in support of uh, employees, for example. Um, uh, I mean, that's. <laughs> Kind of what's 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 fitting in for an employee's lifestyle so them kind of having the chance to determine their working hours and um place of place of work so it's fitting around their care care obligations with for children or older people or or what they what they want what else they want to do with their lives um uh you know quite a few companies you know, looking at their employment practices, um, how they can uh, extend opportunities to people who um, who normally wouldn't have the opportunities. So, um, um, and Ella, Ella Bow itself um, has a has a policy towards recruitment of refugees and immigrants and um, teaching of English, um, and and that kind of um, you know, job readiness, getting them to job readiness. So those sorts of things, yeah. Okay, thank you. Anka, did you want to weigh in at all on that? Yeah, I'm happy to add to that. So um, a couple of months ago, I did a, a session on the Sustainable Development Goals. And one of the things that came up was the idea of the I'm having I, trouble I, hearing you. Yeah, I was going to say, I, the, the audio is wrong. Oh, really? Can you hear me now? No. Okay. Yeah, I just... We can hear you, but it sounds like you're speaking through a very deep, dark tunnel. <laughs> so um, maybe we can move on and, um, you know, sorry, Anka. <laughs> Um, well, I'll move to a next question by Philip um, Mervis, who asked a really great question. Um, what happens when there is not community consensus, um, which seems to be the norm in most communities nowadays? Um, for example, woke capitalism, shareholder activists taking down Danone. Um, you know, what, what, um, how, do, how does the common good get defined in these polarized times, Bridget? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good question. And, it, and it's about kind of um, it's it's about tr trying to create the dialogue, isn't it? It's really about you know that kind of how, how do you get people together to do some really deep listening and and providing a lot of information. But it's we know now that it's not about information. If it was about information and facts. We'd have we'd have solved a lot of these things a long time ago. <laughs> And so it is about, you know, what, what, what else is going on? What are the values? You know, what are the, I mean, you, you guys are the experts in this. <laughs> um, well, I'll weigh in there because I mean, as somebody who studies organizational leadership, I mean, I think that's been one of the leadership failures of our society, right? Is that we are trying to um, get our policy conversation stuck at fixing existing systems instead of really imagining what is the world that we want to live in? What does an ideal world look like? And having kind of these visionary conversations um, and then, you know, being willing to restructure around that. I don't see that visionary um, type of thinking and conversations happening. Um, and I'll, Jen can weigh in here, but I think that's one reason the arts are so important, right? Is it helps mm -hmm. people develop that moral imagination, that imaginative capacity where they can um, see, see the mango instead of just the apple and the orange to use your example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Um, Bring on me. the art. Sorry, Philip. Uh, hi, thank you, uh, Bridget, this is good stuff. 
Um, there are some structural mechanisms. I mean, talk is important and dialogue. But if you look, for example, at Mondragon in Spain, which is the, mm -hmm. one of the largest uh, and historic uh, uh, cooperative enterprises, they have governance mechanisms that sort of allocate voice and uh, put constraints uh, in situations where there isn't consensus. Um, you know, remember it is ESG where governance is one of the criteria. And mm -hmm. we, haven't, we haven't been very imaginative about how that might translate into both stakeholder capitalism and more mm -hmm. broadly as a societal voice beyond regulation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'd like to kind of throw in a question for you based on what Philip just said um, that, you know, how a lot of times when I have future conversations with people and say, well, what if it was different? Because they're like, well, this is what we have to deal with now. And I'm like, fine, but what if we could create things differently? And a lot of what they come to is they revert to the fear that it's not possible, like they want it and they will agree with it, but they don't believe it's possible. So how do you help people overcome that it's not possible fear? Well, I think, uh, I mean, it's, I think some of it's kind of that um, mental map stuff, you know, so out, out of the models we had earlier, you know, what, what is your, what is your model in, in your mind? Um, because that, you know, if, they, if they're stuck in the kind of the first model, it, it's, it's very hard for people to, you know, to make a switch and, and do something else. So I think a lot of it is, um, and that's part of the unpicking, isn't it? What are our, what are our core beliefs and what are our, you know, mental, mental images? Um, and, and then there's the lens of, of future generations of kind of longer term thinking. And that makes, that makes people um, really, really change their ideas. There's a really lovely exercise in them. Um, I'm not sure where he got it from. It might've been from someone else, but Roman Krzanik, K-R-Z-N-A-R-I-C, the good ancestor book. There's, um, there's an exercise that you do with people and um, and then you say, right, okay, um, there's, there's various scenarios. You, you were gonna, you know, we're gonna play a game and you could be, um, you could be born in, at any time. Could have been born a hundred years ago, 50 years ago now, or um, you know, sometime in the future, but you don't know you don't know where, you know, in which period. Um, oh, and, and I think there's another level as well about you could be you could be born, you know, in any part of the world, in any in any community, in any you know income level. And that now design the rules of um, of society. You know, what well, now? Let's discuss how society should be organised when you don't know which period you're going to be born into. And which which level of society? So it's yeah, it's kind of it's getting into people's kind of beliefs and um, yeah, so trying to trigger it, trigger the empathy, I guess. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the uh, next question is from Alexander. Um, he said, money is per definition a public good and should serve the public. Um, it should rotate and flow and not be stacked. Um, I guess leading to the growing inequality said so the Pareto distribution of it has no public goal. Um, is it surprising that no monopolistic, duopolistic or oligopolist is in the rankings? Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I kind of heartily agree, heartily agree. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's, um, we can see the kind of dangers of that sort of monopoly behavior and, and how companies are having more and more influence on politics and it's, you know, undermining our, our democracy. And, and Christian talks of us being in a, not in a post democratic time, but in a pre pre-democracy you know, that we haven't truly experienced it yet. 
I have a follow-up question on that because it's something that we've been discussing in my household. I've got a very socially aware son. And, you know, questions about doing business with China or doing business with Saudi Arabia, you know, countries that are not, <laughs> not democratic. Um, how, you know, can we as people who are concerned with human rights and, um, you know, the common good, can we justify doing business with some of these countries and governments um, or should we be avoiding them? And, you know, there's obviously pros and cons to engagement versus non-engagement. Um, so I just wanted to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Christian's written a whole book on this. It's called Trade for Good. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that, you know, that's, um, you know, it's, it's the kind of sort of same issue, really. It's kind of, you know, well, what's trade for? Trade's not for trade's sake. Trade is to kind of, you know, what, why are we buying these goods and services and exchanging goods and services? It's to, to meet needs. And so kind of the first question is, do we really need it? Um, that whole question of sufficiency, you know, what makes for a good life and, you know, do we need certain products? Um, uh, and you know the his kind of his his model would be you know the world as, as the kind of world trade organization you'd have a word world world ethical trade organization so so you know pe people will be operating if 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 they um if they weren't respecting all the kind of values within the kind of common good balance sheet then you slap massive tariffs on them so, you know, if, okay, you trade, but if you don't meet these criteria, then you will have a very, very high tra tariff. And so, so yes, they do always remain a concern, you know. And that just, like, I can hear my neighbors screaming, world government, fascism. <laughs> so. Well, well that, that's one response. Another response is, um, uh, you know, dem democratic, you know, values, underpinning of, of human rights, uh, safeguarding of the planet, safeguarding of well-being of people. Um, yeah. I love that. That's one way to look at it. <laughs> that was a great response. Um, so everybody, we have about uh, 10, 12 minutes left. If you were interested in getting a certificate of completion for participating in this, we need your name and your email, the first name, last name, email, and which certificates you want. I offer an HRCI, a SHRM, or a general certificate of completion. Just put it in the chat room and I'll pull it down and make sure you get those later today. Elizabeth, do we have any other questions? Um, we do. So Anka typed in her response. Um, she says, I was referring to the concept of dignity at work in terms of economic aspects, such as fair wages, contracts, et cetera, to meaningful work and opportunities for progression. Um, and she did a lunch and learn in August, remember, where she talked about um, you know, this in the context of sustainable tourism. And I remember from that, I was so struck and you know, the apprenticeships in Germany for servers um, and how they're treated with, you know, as professionals, which is so in contrast to the United States where they're, they're treated like almost invisible disposable people. Um, so you might want to check out that webinar. The, the, it's in the, our I, HMA archives. Um, let's see. And then um, Alexander responded, is that working in the field of tourism a good example? And he had said Spanish and Turkish. And I think that's where she had, why I brought up the Germany example is that yes, there are models of how tourism can be sustainable. And that's all we've got, although they, we do have a couple more in the um, pre-registration. So should I ask some of those? Yeah, go ahead. I was actually interested in um, the, how the micro businesses and solopreneurs might mm -hmm. uh, be doing business in a common good sort of way. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yeah, that's absolutely possible. Um, uh, there's a few um, solo traders and micro entrepreneurs who've done common good balance sheets and um, there's a kind of um, 
adapted adapted sort of version this is a compact version you don't need to do the kind of full the full thing and there's also um a new a new kind of tool uh, to help people complete a come good balance sheets um an online tool called the good balancer and um and that's made it a lot easier because it then um it then becomes clear which which fields you need to kind of complete and which ones you don't so that's a that's a really good good help for the kind of smaller organizations um so another question we had then was the role of ethics in all of this. So a lot of companies have ethics compliance officers and those kind of things, but um, this is almost more of a lived ethics. Um, and so do you have any suggestions or have you seen successful practices of how companies have shifted from that ethics as compliance to ethics mm -hmm. as shared relational, you know, concern and mutual flourishing? Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Um, I, there's not an, not an example that's kind of sprung out of my head in terms of that um but but you're absolutely right it's about it kind of being lived you know all the way through the organization and and discussed and brought to life and one one of the ways of um you know the best way for an organization to to do a common good balance sheet is is when the the staff the staff are free to um, kind of gather in groups. It could, it's, could be around the kind of the values or around the um, stakeholders, but they organize, you know, across across kind of hierarchies if there are hierarchies. So they're acting as equals in the group and they, they're researching all the questions, you know, and finding out the information. And that, um, you know, in the actual process of compiling the report, it kind of releases a lot of enthusiasm and um, interest and, and ideas, because of course um, people are they're seeing the company in a kind of much more 360 degree sort of way. They're kind of working with each other. They can see where their job fits in with with the company. And there's a kind of lovely lovely quote of. Um, uh, one of the companies that was an organic food wholesaler, he said, you know, some people do really kind of mean, 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 menial, the right word, you know, just kind of, you know, bore, boring work, um, uh, mundane, I think I'm well, meant to say, not mean. Um, he was, he was telling this story to me in German and, and um, just trying to translate the word. Um, and but when they were involved in one of these groups to kind of create the report you know you know they were going you know beyond their job description and they they could they were really glad that they were being valued in that way for their opinion and um you know they came up with lots of really great ideas for improving the processes in the company um and one 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 of the workers was a cleaner who never never used to see any of, of the other employees because she came in, you know, at the end of the day. She joined a group. Um, was a was a really um, creative thinker, and then she came into a legacy which she which she invested into the company. So it's kind of you know there are all sorts of outcomes that come from um, you know people people being allowed to contribute is which is what they're doing and and of course they're they're investigating for themselves all of these questions and it becomes shared the values become shared across the company thank you um so if they get shared across the company, I mean, then what about um, getting shared, you know, globally where we reimagine, you know, what business looks like? And I think that is what economy for the common good is trying to do, right, is to help shift these global shared values um, and not, um, like Jen said, not against the UN and the politicalization of them, but really, you know, what does it take to stay within that donut, right, that respect yeah. the planetary yeah. boundaries? Mm, absolutely. Well, I think we kind of use we use all you know all angles of available to us. So you know, 
if we are invited to to speak at the United Nations, um, you know, then we'll do it. And um, we were there a couple of years ago in Geneva with Faude, talk, talking about how companies are, are meeting the SDGs. Um, and ECG has also been invited um, this year to talk about alternative economic models. Um, so, you know, there's, there, is, there is that political level um, to work at internationally. Um, um, oh, I was going to say something else and I forgot what it was now. <laughs> um, well, I have a follow up on the political stuff. I live in an ecologically sensitive area and our community just experienced a, a really massive scale, scare that involved toxic kind of radioactive wastewater that was generated decades ago and was never dealt with right and uh, nowadays this particular business is still generating this but they have to pre-fund remediation to even do the business but when the problem that occurred in our area occurred, it was before these rules. So when you're talking about the UN, I'm thinking to myself, well, a lot of the changes in democratic systems are experimented with at a local level, and then they get regionalized, and then they go national, and then they go international. Right? That's, that's the normal progression of change within a democratic society is there's an experiment somewhere. And so my question has to do with how can local communities and governments use the, these tools that the common economy for the common good has created to help them with these local problems that they do have um, that require them to collaborate at regionally and at the state level um, for solutions? Because we have a lot of legacy problems. Like where I grew up, they just found that there's hundreds of toxic um, tubs of radioactive waste off the coast of California. And that turns out to be the reason why all the sea lions were getting cancer. Right? Mm -hmm. And who knows what was happening to the people swimming in the water, right? But these are legacy environmental problems. Mm -hmm. um, and they really are local, very, very local. So it seems to me like, how can we use these tools to help the local governments start addressing not only addressing the present and the legacy, but envisioning a future where we do this sustainably so that we don't have these problems 60, 70 years from now. Absolutely. I mean, thank you, Jane. That was the, that was the other part of what I was going to say that, you know, we use, use all the levels available to us. So there's that international level, but I mean, ECGs is very much kind of grassroots local initiative it's very much about the local and it's and this um this notion of um you know local determination economic subsidiarity what decisions that can be taken at the local level should be taken at the local level and so for in terms of the you know that environmental picture so it's about you know those local people coming together and saying what are the 20 key things for our area that we need to you know that make for a good life for us and you know radioactive waste in the water is not going to be on their top list <laughs> you know and on the top list is usually things like clean clean rivers clean oceans um you know clean local water supply and, and it's, it's coming back to that thing that, you know, people, you know, we, we design this stuff in it, in it, in it, it's, and that's, and that, and we've just forgotten it or, or we, we never knew it, but it, because it's the, the current um, system seems so, you know, what did Margaret Thatcher say? There's no alternative. Well, there are plenty of alternatives. ECG is one of them. But it, there are, you know, this comes down to that design. There's a quote from, I think I've probably just lost it in my notes now. But um, yeah, from, from Aristotle through Thomas Aquinas to Adam Smith, there was a consensus that economic theory and practice had to both, had to be both legitimized and limited by an overriding goal which in Greek is telos, such as the common good. And it's down to that kind of, you know, people, people having the conviction 
and and the courage to to design it you know for ourselves and and claim that responsibility i think that is a perfect way to end our conversation um so thank you so much bridget for everybody watching this um we will be putting the list of resources that bridget talked about on the website along with the video um, so that you all have access to the list of books she mentioned and the tools that the economy for the common good had. So thank you so much, Bridget, for joining us again. This thank was thank you very much. Thanks for listening. This was the um, International Humanistic Management Association's Professionals Lunch and Learn. Uh, we try to do this about every month, so check our schedule. The Humanistic Management Association has a variety of activities every month, uh, so just check out our calendar and and join us.